Today on Sagittarian Matters, zines, queerness, coming out, decolonizing your sexuality, and more, with my very special guest, Sharon Lee De La Cruz. Stay tuned. Sagittarian Matters, Sagittarian Matters, what's the Hello from the Sagittarian Matters Social Distancing Studios in Los Angeles, California. This week, my guest Sharon Lee De La Cruz told us some of her favorite things of the recent pandemic, and in honor of that, I made a short list of my own. Here are some things I've been enjoying. Number one, new places to walk. This sounds so boring, and if you're under the age of 40, Maybe you're already asleep because it's so boring, but I like to drive to a different neighborhood where I don't normally walk and just do a neighborhood walk or just looking up trails, not even through an app, just Googling trails in my area and finding new places to hike and walk, even just for a short amount of time is really shaking things up here a year into quarantine. Okay. Also drag race UK. Listen, hear me out. World of Wonder presents, you can get a free trial for a week. Almost all the episodes are on there, but after that, it's only $3.99 a month. They're not a sponsor of the show, believe me. Um, Drag Race UK, to me, is head and shoulders above Drag Race America. I will be talking about this on an upcoming episode with friend of the show, Brandy Taylor. But if you haven't watched it, you still have a chance to catch up so you understand what we're talking about. Make haste, Drag Race UK. It's more interesting and fun than Drag Race America. In honor of that, I also like Purse First Impressions with Bob the Drag Queen. Uh, Brandy told me about this. It's on YouTube. Bob the Drag Queen is talking with some of your favorite drag queens, including Naomi Smalls and Thorgy Thor, who I did not like on her season, but who is apparently a great drag race host person. Look, I've read this tweet 7 million times, but the truth is drag race is my sports. This is sports to me. I mean, what the frack? That's what I have to say. Okay, another thing I like recently is crushed ice from a refrigerator. I'm subletting a house that has ice and water from a fridge and that actually works, and I'm living my crushed ice fantasy. Another thing I like recently is Linda Berry posting videos of a porch possum. She has a possum house, a possum feeder out there, a couple possums have come and fought over the peanuts she throws them. I'm very into it. I like the book Menopause, A Comic Treatment. If you haven't found that, look it up yet. If you haven't found that yet, look it up. And also, I am still in the midst of reading the Eileen Miles book, For Now, which is a beautiful little book. It fits in your pocket, and I really enjoy it. Okay, that's my list. Please have a wonderful week. Please go to the Instagram page, Sagittarian Matters, and let us know what has been ringing your bell as we ring in one year in pandemic. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you soon. Sharon Lee De La Cruz is a multidisciplinary artist and activist from New York City. Her work addresses a range of issues related to tech, social justice, sexuality, and race. Sharon's new graphic memoir, I Am a Wild Seed, comes out in April with Street Noise Books. Sharon joined me from New York to talk about her book, Coming Out, Intersectionality, and more. Note to listeners. We also talk about Drag Race UK and more, but some of that got cut for time, so it will go on our special Drag Race UK episode of the podcast. In the meantime, please enjoy my talk with new friend to the show, Sharon Lee De La Cruz. I got excited watching the video on your website where you're talking about zines, because I've, you know, I started doing zines when I was 14, and I... I've always wanted to pay back what zines did for me, like how finding confessional zines made me feel like I wasn't alone and kind of saved my life. And so then my mission statement for life has been to try and like share the tools of production so people can amplify their own voices for social change. And I feel like a lot of the things I saw you talking about in your zine video, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like just the spirit of DIY. And I wonder what... Is there a place that zines, what place do zines have in your self-expression or your artist story or your writer story? Yeah. Your I mean, story? Yeah. It is like, to me, it's like, a, so I did graffiti. 
for a while um, and mural making. And to me, zines are like the tags, the bomb bombings that you see everywhere. And there's like such a, you know, it's so genuine and so free. And I really, and I come back to zines to remind me of how free you can be, right? Like, and how free a book can be and that it doesn't have to like look like one thing. Um, yeah, and I think like what zines did for me was like, I remember like putting, you know, the the one that you learn first, the one page zine, you know, putting it together. And I was like, shit, I made a book, you know, like I didn't need a publisher. I didn't need an editor. I didn't even need anybody to copyright it, you know, like, or like to, sorry, to copy edit it. Like I just made a thing and I could share this thing with someone else and it looks pretty legit, you know, like I was like, okay, that's cool. So man, yeah, zines just get me excited about like, also like punk feminism is like the only way to go. You know, um, I lived in Peru for a year in 2008 and nine and um just thinking about the women that i met there who are still my friends who you know we still talk um and love each other and thinking about them and like how punk they are you know and like they get me so excited to just one because like also the the like punk feminism in peru is like like it's just like so raw <laughs> and it's so beautiful and i'm like man this is what punk is, you know, like, it just, like, it's so, it's so, like, and ridiculous in the best way, you know, like, it's just, like, so raw and out there, and I feel like sometimes I'm missing that in the States, you know, like, I'm just, like, oh, where, where's that spirit, you know, and every time I go to Peru, I feel it, I'm, like, oh, this thing, you know, um, also because of, like, the, you know, the politics and the, you know, economy and just kind of, you know just like the 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 society down there it is um it just makes for like some punk ass shit and so zines remind me of peru you know zines remind me of just like how raw things sh- like should be um and how and also like the agency to like just create something without permission you know like you're not asking anybody permission to like make this thing um it's really, yeah, it, it gets me super, super excited. I feel like even now, as I am like pushing, pushing towards middle aged, you know, and I feel like, okay, I meet my needs. I go to sleep at a decent hour. I have teeth now, like whatever the thing is, <laughs> I still can tap into that almost like primal place that really needs that, that needed that space. Like yeah. I, um, The place I grew up has a Facebook group for old punks from Kansas City. And I went on there and I was like, I still fucking hate so many people on here. And I was, (laughs) I was able to tap back in to just being like, ah, like, yeah, like the, the thing that feels very necessary about punk feminism, like the reason why it saved my life, it's all still there. So even though I'm like, you know. I don't know, like, I don't have a shaved head anymore. Look at me. I still can tap into that feeling and be like, oh, yeah, this is still important to me. Yes. Like, this yeah. thread is why I even get to exist. Yeah, and I feel like I feel similarly to graffiti. I don't do it anymore, but, man, the minute I see it or the minute I see, like, a spray can or, like, touch a spray can again, I'm like, oh, okay, great. You know, like, I know. I know why we're here, you know, like at the end of the day when like I don't have technology, I'm going to pick up a spray can, you know, and I'm like, fine. And that feels that feels punk and it feels really, really good. Yeah. And, and again, it you know, I'm not practicing it daily anymore. But the minute I even just like look at a spray can, I'm like, oh, I know. OK, you know, it's, it's totally a reminder. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, th- I think I might make zines my entire life. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense, <laughs> especially it's like the cut. It's 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 not a. You're not as asking anyone for permission, no. and you should never. No matter what the age is, right? Like, you don't lose that, you know, or you should you shouldn't maybe lose that. Well, it's it's also one of the things you know to tie it into punk feminism, like you were talking about with no permission. It's also like 
there's so many places where there's so many places where men for no good reason have asserted themselves as experts who have to tell mm. you what to do and you have to jump all these hurdles and it's generally straight white guys yeah we could say all, many white guys but uh, mostly straight <laughs> white guys but it's like i mean it just it goes through all things it's like this is a stretch but like when we talked to caitlin dowdy this um death this death expert for the podcast she was like oh yeah like um you know, death used to be kind of like midwives where people would take care of their own dead and they would wash the bodies and take care of their own dead. And then it got privatized. And because of capitalism, men stepped in and were like, oh, no, you can't deal with your own dead. That's so dangerous. We need to do it for you. And here it's very expensive. It's like right. with birth where it's like pe- midwives yes. used to do it. They took care of it. And then, you know, medical establishment stepped in and was like, you couldn't possibly do it. How could you figure that out? We'll do it. But I feel like with zines you know, just like with punk music, it's like there doesn't need to be a man there being like, you're doing a good job or a bad job or here's how right. you do it. It needs to sound perfect. It's actually, it's not that fucking hard to play right. a song, to play a punk song or to make a zine. Like it's not rocket science. There's no mystery behind it. You just get to do it. Yes. And someone will be glad you did it. So I, I love the idea of people, of DIY, you know, like legit DIY. Yeah. And, and also... You don't have to have like Illustrator, Photoshop, you know, like all of those barriers don't exist, right? Just grab a piece of paper and a pen and then go to Staples, you know, <laughs> and copy the shit out of it, right? Like that's all you need. And so again, like that barrier and this like no need and, and also, which I think is, you know, still remains important and I kind of like drive this in my head is like, it's not the software that makes the story, that makes the art, that you know, that makes the artist chill, bro. You know, just because you don't have Procreate or an iPad doesn't mean, you know, like, so I think um, reiterating that for younger folks, for me, you know, I'm like, oh, right, I don't need the fancy software to animate. Cool. Stop making excuses, you know, like, it's okay. Oh, Let's yeah, no, like <laughs> nobody's work. I mean, I really think perfectionism is the enemy of productivity. And I just feel like if I have something important to say, it's kind of like if you write a letter and then you leave it around too long and then you reread it before you send it and you're like, oh, yeah. no, I have to rewrite this. I can't possibly send this now. It's totally out of date. Just like that feeling, like if you feel yeah. like you need to get to a place of perfection before you can publish something, that's never going to happen. Like you're you're expectations of yourself or your goals are shifting those those goalposts are shifting all the time Mm -hmm. daily and that's why I like really enjoy when I got into uh got on Instagram that's why I really enjoyed it I was like oh these like low stakes comics that I can just like put out into the universe that like can just and, and usually when I started like really publishing my comics online it was like one panel. I was like, great. I don't even have to think about like transition method. I was like, here you go. Here are my feelings, you know? (laughs) And then people were responding to my feelings and I was like, oh, cool. That's cool to like, see that response. And then, you know, and then challenge yourself to play, right. And to get more challenging, but also that like, you're not forced to play or to be, you can be as challenged as you want. And there's no right or wrong, you know? Um, And that was what was really cool about publishing, you know, online, quick, nothing, nothing too crazy. There's still the whole, like, amount of likes, which is, like, really annoying. But nonetheless, you know, just kind of, like, putting it out there um, and fast, right? And and things that are fast was, was super nice and, for me, compelling. Today's episode is brought to you by Emily Helmus, Zoe Wirth, Laura Perry, Demetra Halutsos, Shoshana Ruth Wachter, Christy Herod, and Joey Soloway. If you would like to support Sagittarian Matters, in particular, producer Chris Sutton, please send $5, $5 million, that's your business, to hornetleg at gmail.com on PayPal. That's hornet like the insect, leg like its appendage at gmail. Or, this just in, he's got a Venmo, Hell Books on Venmo. That's H-E, double hockey sticks, books. 
thank you for your support, and we look forward to saying your name on the podcast. Patricia Ponyo looks forward to it too. Don't be scared. That's just Ponyo's speaking voice. How did this book come to pass? What was and I, I feel like yeah, it, that, I feel like that went through several iterations. It seems like yeah, it was so one. It's my first long form comic, so I didn't know what the hell I was doing, <laughs> right? Like it was just me saying, "Hey, I want to try to answer this question my friend asked me one time," because it's like layered. But it informs a lot of not just my identity, but like how I see the world. Um, I guess because of my identity, but also I feel like it could be, um, it could be a fun way to not not just explain, but experience a little bit of like that intersectionality and and hopefully just get people to understand how either they're playing into patriarchy or toxic masculinity in in all sorts of different ways and and perhaps um start really questioning what they're doing or like reflecting more you know on like what they do and and how they do and 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 presentation which I think is super important so it was my friend Jess who asked me like you know a, a fun little question what does freedom look like to you as a POC like queer person and I was like what who no one's ever asked me that but I know the answer you know and immediately it's uh when trans black women are like safe and free to just be themselves uh and you know that whole thought process (laughs) I was like I need this in a book because I need to explain this to like masses friends you know (laughs) like don't can't quite make those or some who haven't quite made that connection yet as to like why you know why my freedom would be contingent on an identity that is not mine Mm -hmm. and I I feel like you unpack that really well throughout the book oh great (laughs) that was the hard that was I mean look I I was very overwhelmed with this book because I was like, shit, am I even going to do a good job? Am I even the person to like do this thing, you know, um, to talk about this? But I realized, okay, Sharon, (laughs) it's not about like the perfect book, but in fact, the most careful that you can be. Because one thing I did not want to do is like, uh, one speak for anyone else right so even if my freedom is contingent on another identity I never in in any of the book wanted to like conflate that identity as mine or that I'm speaking for a black trans person because I am not you know um so I when I when I uh when I shifted the perspective from like oh this needs to be like super clear and perfect blah to okay let this be the most um, careful. You know, how can you be the most careful? Um, I think that really switched things up for the book, especially in in terms of gaze. Um, Because I even believe that, like, when I went to Tin House, I was having a lot of problems um, at the point, at at that point, the book for me felt very, like, white male gaze. I was like explaining everything, you know, like just explaining things. And I was like, this, this one feels um, laborious when it's not supposed to, you know, Um, but also, you know, I I wasn't telling a story. I was just kind of like explaining things. And I was like, fuck this. You know, like when I watched The Breakfast Club, no one explained to me whiteness. I just, I just like understood it, you know, um, or like knew it as a certain thing that was like being displayed to me, right? But like no one explained it to me. So I was like, oh, I don't, I don't have to explain anything. I mean, unless it's like narrative, <laughs> you know, unless it's like the story arc and, you know, like, and, and more like the technical narrative aspect. Sure. I was like, I'll explain that all day, but I'm not going to explain. Um, I refuse to kind of like explain like the little nuances that I know someone could just like Google themselves, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, so that that was like a, a really big deal when I went to Tin House. I was just like, 
I'm perpetuating the white gaze. Ah! You know, I just like cried and I was like, no. And almost throughout the whole book. <laughs> until How did my you edit- save it? Well, my editor was like, wait a minute. You did a lot of work. <laughs> and you're also, there's a lot of still gems here. What do you want to keep versus like, what do you want to rewrite versus what do you think just you don't want anymore? And I'm glad that she like saved me, <laughs> reeled me back because I was ready to burn, burn it all down. I was like, fuck this. Um, but I was happy I, I didn't. Um, and that I was like, okay, how am I taking what I wrote and making sure that it, again, not explained a story, but took you through a story? And, um, and how am I careful about the gaze in, in the story? It's really generous of you to even set out to write a book that you're like, I need this to make sense to cis people. Why this is important to me. I need to actually explain intersectionality and some queer history and decolonization to people. Yeah. And, and mainly, to be honest, I think I was more okay with that because I, that was what I was explaining to myself. Because even if I had the inkling of queerness when I was young that shit was like almost like slapped out of me, you know, and was like, okay, no, you're going to think of all of this in a very like cis heteronormative way. And so, you know, when I explain some of that, to be honest, it's more like um, how in, how in me being raised, was I like fighting that or like what I learned and then what I had to like unlearn kind of thing, you know? Yeah. How old were you when you came out? Oh, I, man, it was Mother's Day, and I think I was like to, uh, 30. Yeah, I'm 34 now. <laughs> so I was like 30. It was Mother's Day, and my, you know, and I took my mom to Applebee's because that's like her favorite restaurant. <laughs> and,. She made a sly comment, you know, about like, she's going to date women. And I was like, welcome to the club. And she just looked at me, she's like, and it was like a little too serious, you know, for her. And she was like, what? I knew it, you know, kind of like, I knew it. And, and even, you know, was like, is it the girl with the glasses? I'm like, lady, there's a lot of girls with glasses. That's one. But like, I don't know. I was like, I'm not explaining this to you. Like, this is weird. <laughs> that um but yes it was it was late or not late you know I hate to say like late but it was definitely like I was older well I wondered when I was reading that part if it felt like you had more um you know you're just stronger when you're older because you're more independent and you've learned to extract yourself from your parents idea of who you are yes so in some ways it seems like I don't know if it's a safer place but it seems like a place where you're stronger than if you're like a teenager and your parents have control over everything yes for sure and and you know and also like at that point too I'm like I've been paying my bills for how many years you know like I've been doing this for I've been adulting for how many years in fact you're my independent now for how many years you know like that you know it wasn't easy but it was definitely like I felt more confident for sure I'm I'm wondering like it seems like your queerness was a little bit I don't know if it's if, so from the book, it seems like it was like a realization of like, oh, all these, all these kind of scenes are adding up to this. Oh, okay. And now I can go forth and just yeah. live my truth. And I wonder if um, your queerness also shed a light on or crystallized another element of your intersectionality. Yes. Like if embracing that identity kind of brought, made some other things all come together. Yes, and then also complicated other things. And by complicated, I mean like, uh, you know, decolonizing sex, decolonizing what a family could look like, and still working through all of that, you know, um, is very, once you embrace the identity and you're like being your true self, you're like, oh, okay. You know, like it's not like happy unicorns. I mean, some some of it is happy unicorns for sure. But like not, you know, all of a sudden you're just like, oh, this this other thing. Okay, cool. Now I have to kind of like 
decolonize these other aspects because it just doesn't feel the same anymore, right? Like, or, um, so embracing was like really awesome, but then it opened up another can of worms that you like kind of didn't deal with. (laughs) Um, and, and that's the great thing I think about and like why I think queerness is awesome is like, you can't unsee, you know, how like great it is, you know, but, and then at the same time, you have to like, then work through the things that are like super ingrained in in your life and I continue to still kind of like work through the things um that are ingrained you know um as, and and kind of like an obvious thing would be like family like you think children kind of thing you know like this like heteronormative idea of like what does a growing family look like um and so kind of like dealing with those not only just like desires but like if those desires are even yours or not or and if they are fucking great but like how do you know and or and or where can those desires live beyond like heteronormative uh ideas of family you know and and growing something um together so i i think i've been still <laughs> marinating on um, on some of that for sure well, there's so many things that are so deep. Um, they're so deep and they're so tied to capitalism, too, oh, of just yes. like, here's the markers of adulthood. Yes. Here's the markers of success and of evolution as a human being. And then, yes. you know, when you are living outside of that with your queer family or just as a queer person or just right. as a marginalized queer person you're like I have other markers of success or of adulthood or of truth or embodiment yeah and I'm glad you said that because it it totally is the marker of success like what is the marker of success for being an adult and 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 being fulfilled what is what's the yeah what is I'm glad you framed it like that because it's totally that it's you know it's it's almost not even just about desire but it's about what is a su- successful, fulfilled person, you know, feel like and, and look like? And when it's not about capitalism, you're just like so free to do so many other things. And it's really nice. <laughs> and it's such a great feeling. I'm like, oh, great. I don't have to like, I don't have to. And I feel like I- I'm going to bring in this like live example. When I worked at Princeton, um, I had like such great benefits you know, the insurance was fucking amazing, <laughs> you know, um, good salary. And, and then I ended up being kind of like miserable, you know, um, but I, I bought into this kind of like 401k, you know, <laughs> kind of thing like, oh, and, and I mean, you know, arguably those still are important, right? But it was like, this was adulting and this is the way you should, and, and capitalism, right? Like this is the way you should, um, you should be like building slash preparing for you getting older kind of thing. And it was just hideous. <laughs> it, was, it was like not, not great. And I wasn't happy. Um, yeah, I just like wasn't, wasn't happy. And, and although like, yes, I still want to like own a house. I feel like Valerie and I are like more thinking, well, let's go to Puerto Rico. Like, fuck this place, you know, <laughs> like, let's go. Um, and so just kind of like thinking a little more, uh, creatively about like where you set your roots, you know, and where you build foundations, um, as well. But yeah, it, it is totally a marker of success for sure. And, and that is really hard when for your whole life, a marker of success was like, have a full-time job, you know, get benefits and, and buy that house and have those children with a husband, you know, and you're like, duh. One of the things that you take on and explain in your book is the idea of toxic masculinity. Why did it feel important for you to put that in your book? Because your book is, it's a memoir, but it also has a historical context, has a political context. Yeah, so actually, when I started this book, it was a hodgepodge of a hot mess called my brain, right? And I'm just like throwing up everything that I have in my brain. I was like, here you go, here you go. And 
the that post or the that a uh, diagram that's in the book was actually this kind of like this poster that I made to explain to myself <laughs> my thinking slash uh trying to explain to others and actually I I put a feeler out um on Instagram when I first created the diagram and I just like asked my community hey this is how I'm thinking about toxic masculinity can you let me know um, or would you be kind enough to like let me know like if I'm missing some holes here like what do you think about these connections and I thought that was like a really great way to um, engage in dialogue with folks who I trust um, and who I consider friends and who I consider folks who are thinking expansively about a whole bunch of things and so um, when I put it out I got really great feedback from folks saying well you know don't make sure that like gender isn't just binary you know and I was like fuck yeah okay great so like change that up then someone else you know told me something else right like but they were like a lot of like fun small big things right like they're huge um that I changed up on this uh, diagram and that was from feedback from folks who like I love and adore um and yeah, and, and I guess like I put that together again to just kind of like get this noggin a little more organized. <laughs> Cause like I make the connections, but they look like, you know, spider webs all over the place. <laughs> and if I wanted to actually attempt to explain my freedom, I think I had I, I had to talk about toxic masculinity. Because we could all, you know, exercise that. What are, is there anything else you want people to know about the book that you feel like this is something I need people to know about this book? This is what I want people to know about this project. Oh, yeah. One is that like, this is just one person's perspective, right? Um, another thing that I was like dealing with, I was like, I am, you know, I am not carrying a whole race on my shoulder, <laughs> a whole gender on my shoulder. I was like, I'm not interested in that. So that's why I kind of kept this book in like little vignettes, you know, and, um, and tried to tell the most personal stories, um, as I could, even though, you know, I was like inserting, you know, historical context in there. I was like, okay, it's really important that this be a memoir, right? Like that this be just your story so that it's not mistaken as the story of intersectionality. Um, so, so I, I definitely want folks to also be able to like challenge some of the things that I say in this book, you know, or, and, and by challenge is like question and talk about it and have dialogue and, um, and come up with your own intersectional <laughs> stories, right? Like I, I want, I want more, I want to hear more. Um, and again, this is only just like one perspective. Um, yeah. The world is waiting for you. And it's a gay amazing world. I'm Karen Thompson. And I'm Nicole J. Georges. And we're the hosts of The Gay Amazing Race, a new limited series podcast about the amazing race, your favorite reality competition show from an LGBTQ point of view. We are going to talk to gay amazing guests, including Oswald Mendez, Team Guido, the married lesbian ministers, and more. Plus, we will learn behind the scenes gossip, trivia, we'll talk about gay villains, the closet, archetypes, processing challenges that we just can't forget, and more. And beyond that, you'll also have a gay amazing soundtrack scored by the Kaya Wilson. This music has been described as Enya-esque with druidic energy. So listen to us, the gay amazing race, wherever you get your podcasts. Gay amazing race, the gay amazing race. Race. I want to know a lot of things, yeah. but <laughs> I really want to know if you have some favorite things from recent days. We're now coming upon a year in pandemic. Yes. We're coming upon a year here of uh, a little bit of a lockdown. This is the year 2021. And I want to know what are some, what are some things that have been that, what are your top, some of your favorite things are your, do you have a top three or five list? Yes. Oh man. Okay. So my, from a friend, from like a book club, I discovered this wonderful person called Rita Indiana. 
I don't know if you know about them. Um, they're, speaking of punk feminism, uh, punk feminist from Dominican Republic, and they just came out with a, let me, I, I'm just going to make sure I say this correctly, because I think it's, um, it's a, it, it's a new song, so Rita, Indiana, um, and the song is called Mandinga, um, Mandinga Times Presents After School. And if you look at that video on YouTube, it's literally the best thing. It's so first of all, when I when I looked up Rita Indiana, um, I looked them up because of a book um, that they wrote, but but uh, the way they just the way they were described online was uh, as a musician who makes experimental merengue, mm. and I was like, wait a minute. This seems like a little too close to my heart. Why haven't I heard this before? And I looked them up and they're fucking brilliant. They're really great. So I'm I'm really happy to have discovered Rita Indiana um and like their crazy shit that they have online. I'm into it. <laughs> um yeah, so so Rita Indiana after school, look it up on YouTube, amazing. Um, the second one is, and again, I don't know, I feel like I'm always late on everything, but I just read <laughs> Super Mutant Magic Academy. I don't know why I hadn't read it before, but a friend um, recommended it, and I was like, I love Jillian Tamaki. Can we be friends? You know? Um, and I follow them on Instagram, and I'm just a little too excited, and they don't know who I am, but I love them so much. Their humor is, like, fucking spot-on crazy. I just, Always. like, I can't. Yeah, I can't. And I was like, oh, I love you. So that book, stellar. Um, pottery Throwdown. HBO what is Mac. Pottery Throwdown? Oh, my God. <sighs> Pottery Throwdown is like the best British ceramics competition show you'll ever see. <laughs> and it is like, it's so lovely. I don't know. Recently, my partner and I, we just like, we just want to watch the genre, like feel good British uh, reality competitions. There's also the flower fight. That's like British and amazing. I like, I just like, I, I want to see people make art in five hours. I don't know why I get thrilled. <laughs> off of that but but I do um and then the last one that I'll mention is uh Lovecraft oh uh, Lovecraft have you seen it no I couldn't tell if I should see it or not I was because I'm a twitter hag yeah yeah and so I yeah. was seeing people be like oh yeah and then oh no and so then I couldn't I felt confused yeah no I I say I I think they did such a beautiful job it's a little confusing in the beginning but that's purposeful like it you know it, it, it starts coming oh wait together. I did start watching it and some of the HP Lovecrafty and like monster stuff at the very beginning I was like I don't know yeah 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 you're just like a little like wait what and then like it just keep, kind of like keeps like in the first four, I think four episodes you know we were just like what you know but we just for whatever reason just like kept tuning in weekly and then by episode five you're just like fucking brilliant you know like it they do some like the most weird shit and it's really beautiful and I have not seen this type of storytelling um that really like honors and like all of the complexities of like blackness um in a show it was it was really really beautiful yeah and I was just you know there there are a couple episodes where I one in particular I think it's like maybe episode nine eight um where you know I'm just like crying like oh I love you all so Lovecraft Lovecraft definitely did it and it reminds me too of like the type of stories I want to continue to tell you know like I want more monsters in my future stories I want more things that turn into other things I want mushrooms you know like <laughs> I want more herbs um I want snails you know like I want more things um, and more like magical realism in in the stories. Like I, I'm just thinking through Lovecraft. I'm thinking through um, why am I blanking out on his name now? Um, Us, 
uh, Jordan, not, yes, Jordan Peele. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. I'm thinking about horror. I'm thinking about sci-fi and what those two things look like when you're, like, retelling historical Black experiences. And, and of course, like, the mother of everything, Octavia Butler, right? Like, you think about all of those things and you're like, holy shit, there's, like, so many more stories we can tell. <laughs> uh, um so I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about all of that. Literally, I have Wild Seed tatted on my knuckles because I fucking that was the first Octavia book I read, and I was like, who the fuck is this woman, and how does she know me so profoundly? And she wrote this in like 1987, and I was one. You know, I was like, I don't know who are you. You know, I was like, fuck, you're amazing. Um, but anyway, like, just thinking through just like what she's done yeah just like what she does so well and that like her magic is rooted in in this earth right like it's it's rooted in real spiritual practices right like she's not not making this out of thin air she makes other things up right like the other things of like the alien you know like whatever shapeshifters but shapeshifters also being like something that is like very real to this universe too so there you know there's a i don't know she just plays so beautifully with um actual grounded like spiritual practices and then just like fucking takes it up a notch you know um and so i will always be like you know indebted to her for just just be just being um what's the word not like brave but like courageous enough to be like fuck this i'm gonna talk about bold bold there we go yeah 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 yeah. and bold enough to say i'm gonna make a story about uh basically like colonialism and put in all of the magic that was supposed to be in your history books in elementary school that is not there and I'm gonna put it into wild seed and I was like fuck you're so it was the first time honestly I read about the black experience that that didn't eliminate the trauma right like it didn't eliminate any of the trauma just, you know which I think is important obviously to like not you know uh, bleach out and make things you know more uh digestible I guess but so stay true to like the actual trauma of enslaved enslaved persons coming um to the not coming well you know being kidnapped um to the u.s but then also in every inch of wild seed is like she never loses sight of the magic of these bodies and and culture and their spiritual grounding and that shit gets me so excited i'm like fuck man you like you understand how like special people are and how magical right and that magic like rabbit coming out of a hat but like fucking for real magical <laughs> um folks are and continue to be and it, and not in in the way of just like being resilient because I, I also kind of have sometimes you know issues with at least contemporary like how folks are you know uh use the word resilient to talk about marginalized folks um but resilient in the way that like no, magic is a part of their being. Um, and it's not just because they're resilient. It's because uh, folks, you know, are just like in another spiritual realm. Like they, you know, they just, they're, they're, they're somewhere else. Um, but anyway, I, I love me some Octavia. <laughs> and, and was very, you know, that, that shit shifted the way I was thinking about myself and books. You know, and I was like, I'm the wild sea she's talking about. Because <laughs> it's also, also like these characters that are not perfect, like they have their own shit going on, and they're very fucking complex. And that was another thing that I hoped to showcase in this small book. <laughs> Is man, you know, there's a lot of things that I said that were like fucked up, um, and there was a lot of things that were like funny about when and why I said certain things but anyway just kind of like showing like the complexity of growing up and also that you know like I love my mom whatever you know like she's not perfect she continues to not be perfect just like I continue to not be perfect and and how do you um how do you love different people around you that you know may or may not understand you fully um but how do you not just exist 
but grow um grow with grow with other people um in a way that like doesn't doesn't um it isn't about um them understanding you fully but in fact like creating a safe space for folks to to feel I guess like feel safe and grow I I know I keep using those same words but yeah just feel comfortable to like be themselves um so not waiting for folks to be perfect but growing with imperfect folks around you yeah I feel like you do a nice job of that in the book kind of between yourself having moments where you're like oh I'm you know I'm sorry I said that thing or oh was I you know was I was I besmirching your safe space or right you know when your friend is like let's go to the gay bar again you know and it's like you were having shifting understandings of things and then that person allowed you to not they didn't go oh no it's fine but they just let I mean in the book they just like let you have that realization on your own and then do your own kind of course correction and it doesn't even feel like in the book you know when your mom's like what is it the girl with the glasses it doesn't even it doesn't even feel like you know it's just like she is she's gonna her perspective's gonna shift and so she's gonna continue to grow with you and you're giving her that space too yeah because so many people gave me the space to grow right um and it doesn't mean that you have to like let everybody grow next to you either you know there's just some people that need to grow over there on the other side of the football field right like go um but there's just some folks like that you don't want to cancel on you know (laughs) that that can that can grow with you and you know that that is that's totally based on it's going to look different for different people um but just knowing that what are you willing to deal with I think Mm -hmm. is a really good question um and and how does that how does that affect you you know and like what what are your and I'm still learning this what are your boundaries I heard somebody say before, like, you know, your life's, your life's like a movie. You get to decide who gets a speaking role and who's just mm. like a walk on. And right. I think it's, and people then their roles can shift. You know, yeah. you don't have to kill them off, but they can, right, right, they right, can get exactly. fewer lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I think that's great. You don't have to kill them off. But right. I, yeah. yeah, yeah, like this season, we're not going to focus on your character. This season, you're going to just, you know, you've, you've had enough. Season one was great. Season one was great. Yeah. It was a hit. It's good. We're just we're focusing somewhere else for season two, and like yeah, maybe maybe we can work into the storyline. Let's see what happens. More will be right. revealed. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. I love that. Sagittarian Matters is produced by Chris Sutton with assistance by Panyo Georges. Our theme music is composed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs of the band Bouquet. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.